Tom. Very, very happy to be chatting with you in my new green room, which is the first time in my new mic, new setup. Magnificent. Um, <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm I'm not too bad at all, thank you. I'm um, I'm just in I'm just in working dad mode. So brilliant. Um, I'm I'm presenting my authentic self here. Very, um, very, very welcome. In my, in, my little, um, in my little study. In your little study with many, many books. Many books. Mm -mm. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to chat with you is because of your most recent book, Wise Animals, but we're going to come to that. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is ask you the question that I always like to open these conversations with. And that's if we think of the world and our species having a global human psyche as a frame, what might you imagine is happening in that global human psyche right now? I guess one of the things about the individual human psyche is you tend to be preoccupied with the information that's available to you. I think a lot about you know, technology and AI and things like that. So I'm very conscious that what you might call mind space, what you might call the kind of space occupied by by minds, by intelligence, you know, our, our view of that is changing. Um, large language models, AI is, is challenging us. Mm. Uh, because it's replicating more and more of our achievements in profoundly inhuman ways. I think humanity, who are always, you know, we're always self-inventing, you know, we're, we're looking around us at machines, at the, the animal world, at the biological world, and maybe we're slightly um, collectively rethinking where we sit in relation to these systems, to the human-made world and the natural world. There's plenty of crises, there's yeah. plenty of um, causes for alarm. But also there's there's opportunity. There's a lot that's up for grabs. There's the challenging of old assumptions. So I'm yeah, I'm fascinated by how collectively we fit into the human made and the and the natural world, which of course ultimately is all one world, all one yeah. great system that we're striving to understand and, and maybe, you know, maybe our understanding is incrementally Im improving, even going to the next level. Yeah, there's um I was reading some of the work that um, Bayo Kamulafi is putting out and, and you know, his, his thinkings and perspectives on this and the idea that there isn't quite so clear-cut a binary of the human-made, the technologically made, which is coming, and nature, that everything arises out of and from in its various permutations, nature. And so it's kind of an interesting perspective to think of it from that, from that viewpoint. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, emergence is one of the buzzwords of our day, but there's, there's research mm. in the physical sciences now into the kind of deep mathematics of emergence. Um, emergence being, you know, how do we, how do molecules, how do atoms, how do galaxies arise from stuff? And these are great abstract questions, but they also bear very directly on the everyday, you know, collective behaviours arise from the individual. Mm. And, and I guess, you know, in, in my work as well, I, I'm obsessed by the fact that we and everything we made arose from you know, subatomic particles arose from the earth, arose from matter. Um, there's no answers in this space, but actually, staggeringly, as you say, there. I think the binaries break down mm. when you look at them. There are patterns of cell similarity. One of my favourite scientific papers of recent times noted the astonishing similarities in the structures of the, the human brain, the kind of connectome of our neurons, um, and the patterns of the cosmic web, the largest, mm. the largest structural organising. Uh, principle we're aware of the structure of kind of dark matter and dark energy on the, on the literally on the scale of the observable universe and obviously there are differences yeah. but the similarities are remarkable some of the organizing principles clearly have a commonality i think at that point and it's it's um not to split between different ways of understanding the world but <clears throat> i always kind of think when you get to that point the kind of fractal zoom in zoom out pattern repetition um, to me, it feels so much like poetry and music, but it's kind of got this, this, this thread that runs through it. Um, so one of the things I'd like to ask, especially as we find ourselves now, and we're recording this at the beginning of June, and there's a lot of different entangled crises, challenges, also potentially opportunities that we're facing. Of the challenges that are present with us today and on the horizon, what feels the most pressing in your mind? What do you, you know, what what does your mind bend towards? What what keeps you up at night? I guess there always there's there's that which is out there. There's the sort of totality, mm -hmm. um, and then there's that which we can individually do and bring. And I think one of the 
one of the great dangers in some ways is to is to look at the complexity of the totality, to look at the awfulness of some, some of what's out there, and then feel that whatever it is you have to bring, it's it's terribly, terribly inadequate. Or again, mm. that you need to bring something into a space where perhaps you don't have much to offer, or you're very um, you know kind of uncomfortable and flawed, but nevertheless you have to go there. And so for me, you know, I, I care about education. I care about. I'm, I'm deeply interested in technology. I care about kind of child raising and nurture and governance, um, and so I, I obsess about these things. I guess you know how should we think about what's going on, mm. and, and also what does it mean? The thing that obsesses me at very different levels is is almost, if you like, a governance question. What does it mean to keep humans in the loop, variously, meaningfully, amid the kind of the volatility, amid amid the velocity, amid the complexity, amid the uncertainty? You know the problems we face politically, ecologically, technologically are vastly complicated. Yeah, they're global. They are about um, enormous complexities that individuals can't grasp. We have to find a collective language, and, and many collective spaces are in crisis. In the kind of the public, the notion of the public space, the idea of you know, kind of commonly accepted ideas of truth. Yeah, um, these are being problematized and fragmented. Um, but 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 we speak. Uh, common languages we have incredible common capacities for understanding so i tend to be very interested in, in trying to situate things in the world to make it concrete you know ai which we're all banging on about <laughs> for me you know the answers don't lie inside the black boxes of code and trying to kind of align ai on on the level of code with human flourishing that strikes me as a, as a false god you know the, the systems are particular and local run by companies they have particular effects on particular people they use particular data so how can we get people get the people who are affected by these systems in the room where they're debated how can we debate the data that's that's used to, to fuel them in concrete and particular and local ways how can we in a sense you know restore people's sense of access yep. to the great questions and, and i guess also from my point of view a lot of the complex and terrible malaises in you know politics and geopolitics and so on are born from many things, but also from people feeling hopeless or excluded or or, or cut out or treated mm. with contempt by political elites, um, or just, of course, the victims of, of warfare and aggression. And that's no one solution to this. But I think speaking in a kind of a common language, so not patronising or dismissing people, is is incredibly important. So in my very, very small way, when I write about critical thinking and cognition and all this stuff, you know, I, I'm I'm interested in kind of inclusivity and optimism as, as strategies and yeah. insistence that actually for those who are willing to debate in good faith, there's a there's a duty of explanation and participation. Um and that this is this is perhaps at least the kind of the kind of hope that I try to build while maintaining an awareness that it's a very small and fragile thing. Mm. I think within that, though, there's also this kind of recognition that, and you mentioned this at the top of the conversation about being flawed humans with whatever little realms of knowledge we might bring, um, and the power being in bringing these different, it's almost like nodes in an ecosystem or a constellation, bringing these together so that we realize that we're not doing this in isolation. Uh, which brings us actually to your book as well. It's, it's creating a language, a framework, a set of perspectives that are made available to people so they can start to interact with the idea of, in this instance, technology, AI, human flourishing, um, to have an access point. And so Wise Animals, how technology has made us what we are, uh, I've been avidly devouring your book while painting the house. And, yes, ah, hold it, it up. And it's beautiful. <laughs> also, <laughs> I have to ask, the top left-hand corner, is that a mushroom? Ah, you see, uh, my poor cover designer. No, it's meant it's meant to be a flint tool. Um, oh, but it no, can be I a mushroom a if you mushroom. like. Mushroom is I thought it was a mushroom. Like a... Yeah. There we are. If only, if only it was a less ambiguous image, <laughs> twice as many people would have bought the book as people in bookshops around the world going, is that a mushroom? It's, they, they're tools they can be what you want because <laughs> i did wonder i was like okay so it's, it's, but you know then i thought well mushrooms can be fire carrying things so that could be perceived as a that. tool no it, yeah. okay it is a mushroom now that's, excellent that's what it is 
<laughs> so I'd love to ask you, we, I, I imagine we probably touched on it already in some of the other um, points that you've made already in this early part of the conversation, but what moved you to write the book to begin yeah. with? So I think actually you hit a nail on the head when you were talking about ways of seeing about stories, about giving people access. So mm. it is a book about humanity's cooperation <laughs> with technology, Sorry. which is a crazy thing to write a book about because it's huge and, you know, who am I to write about that? What do I know? What does anyone know about this huge story? But for me, it's, 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 by some measure, it's my 12th book, depending on whether you count really things. 12 books, books Tom. I mean, some of them are very small. Yeah. Um, it, but I've written quite a few. Um, and I've just, you know, and I've become a parent, become a parent to two children, you know, during the last decade. Um, and, you know, again and again, I try and explain the world to my children. And that, that brings me beautifully up close close with my own inadequacies and the inadequacies of the vocabulary I have, but also, you know, it makes me intensely aware of this incredibly basic fact that as a species, as the, you know, as the great psychologist and philosopher Alison Gopnik puts it, children are the R&D departments of mm. the human species. We are obliged to very effortfully kind of hand on our culture to the next generation. Mm. And they don't just say, thank you very much. Uh, they, they challenge it, they change it. And that's great. Like, like we have to kind of reteach and, to some degree, rethink slash indoctrinate um, our children. And the thing that has bothered me the last you know, 10, 12 years on and off as, as someone who's very interdisciplinary, you know, I'm, a, I'm a novelist and pianist as well as a, as a writer, mm -hmm. um, is it seems to be very dangerous if the ways we talk about technology in the big sense are very narrow and are very dominated by kind of gadgets and features um, and implicitly at least a discourse where certain experts, computer scientists, data scientists and others get to say, this is the way things are. And, um, you know, your concerns, the, the language of, of love, of beauty, of passion, of aesthetics, these, these other languages are not welcome. You know. um, or at least they are lower, lower grade, lower tier. You know, it's sort of, and I, I want to kind of go into tech companies and, and talk about child raising, and children yeah. and love and beauty in a way that has a bit of rigor to it. So the book is an attempt to provide a kind of richer series of perspectives, mm. a richer number of stories that it's possible to tell about what technology is and means. So, for example, I talk about writing as a technology. We forget that writing is a, a technology in every sense. It's an invention. It's a human-made invention. Um, and and I think by by drawing attention to the story of how writing and print and now LLMs came about, we can remind ourselves that even artificial intelligence is at root a cultural technology. Hmm. It's, an, it's an expression, a condensation, a distillation of hundreds and hundreds of years of human thought and feeling and sentiment. Um, and, and it needs to be talked about, I think, in this kind of rich, historically literate, anthropologically literate way. Hmm. So in a way, it's a book that is, that is not saying, here's my one big idea, you know, this is this is the the master idea. It's saying here are a dozen different ways of thinking about our relationships with and through technology in terms of the, the ethics and the values baked into technology, in terms of what it means to to raise children and teach them the next generation and the love that drives mm. this, a word I'm you know, kind of determined not to apologize for, in terms of the our cognitive vulnerabilities, the kind of magic our love of the magical and thus our tendency towards magical thinking, the quasi-religious surge and so on. So it's a slightly bonkers book maybe, but it's but it's it, it's an attempt to tell, you know, a kind of dozen richer stories about technology and thus to try and open up different kinds of conversation that I think are important about value, yeah. about education, about the about the, you know the kind of the urge towards the sublime and the transcendent mm. that that finds its purest expression sometimes in in the geekerati and those <laughs> and those who wish to be raptured by super machines now maybe that will happen but even if it does happen uh, it will still be a kind of atavistic religious um, genealogy of that emotion we're brains in bodies not machines we're utterly unlike our creations. So we really need to be able to draw on all the different human sciences and arts, as well as the hard sciences, if we want to talk about technology with anything like the richness it, it needs. It's, I mean, there's so many, there's so many places. I want to pull on the thread of beauty, on the thread of love, 
Um, and also to the point of, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently, the idea that when we talk about how hu how human endeavors or outputs can be replicated by machines, there's I always come up, up against this sticking point, which is that the substrate, and that, that kind of doesn't do it justice, the, well, but let's use that word for now, the substrate that enables machines, so the physical body of a machine that enables it to compute, to generate whatever artifice it can generate, whether it's you know, deep fake videos or the most beautiful biomimetic architectural designs, like whatever it is, um, is processed because it has a physical body that is very dissimilar to our own. And one of the things that I keep coming back to is that even though many of us in individualistic societies conceive of ourselves as these unitary entities, we ourselves are ecosystemic, you know, all the, the microbiomes that we have, the ways in which we coexist with whatever symbiotes or we might be, the environment, what we eat, what we um, respond to in terms of the pollutants in the air at the time or other people's response to us, that there's such... I suspect that our entanglement with the beings that compose us and surround us are such that we cannot think of humans and machines equally in terms of unitary intelligences. And there's, there's something about that, the organicness and ecosystemic aspect of what makes human, human beings human, that we're just not talking about, that connects to a different type of experience it's the embodiment. It's more a thought, but I'm really yeah. curious what you would make of that. Well, absolutely. And I think I think people like Ian, Ian, Milgru Ian McGilchrist and, mm. uh, and others have written very eloquently about this. And, and you're right. We are we're part of an ecosystem. We're social evolved animals. There's no such thing as an isolated human life. No. One of the reasons to focus on children, I think, is just to emphasize the, the very stark fact that all our accomplishments are born from this astonishing neuroplasticity. We have our, our, our brains... Um, and our minds can can grow and need to be taught. But also, of course, human children are incredibly vulnerable, mm. incredibly dependent. They require love and nurture and collaboration. Um, we've we've traded, you know, over evolutionary history, we've traded toughness and instinct for flexibility um, mm. and smarts. And 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 this in turn means that you know I am literally part of my my daughter's mind, that her community, her family who facilitate, who, who give language, who protect, who feed, who help. We cannot understand the world that we've made alone. And yes, biologically, we are, as Ed Young and others have written, a kind of a compendium of other species. Hmm. Our gut biome, our flora, our fauna, our moods, we're embodied. We're part of nature. You know, one of the most basic things you, you learn uh, when you can give talks to kids, as I do, I go to run workshops for children, hmm. is that, you know, the minds you're dealing with are a kind of an embodied collective. So it is, if you just expect them to sit still for two hours and listen, um, unless you're perhaps a lot more interesting than me or playing a movie, um, you know, you get them playing games, you get people moving, you pay, you know, if you want to help people in terms of finding focus and thinking, paying attention to breathing, paying attention mm. to nutrition. And fairly obviously, although we often forget it, if you're in a state of fear, if you're in a state of discomfort, if you're in a state um, of, of insecurity, of food, of, of water, of the uh, of bodily safety of liberty yeah. that has deep and profound effects upon who you are and what you can do in your scope this is way we are creatures and and our tools are utterly unlike us and immemorially we have offloaded aspects of our minds and social souls to tools and language um david chalmers and andy clark's extended mind hypothesis kind of talks about this and makes the very obvious point that the first time one of our ancestors used their fingers to count, mm. to, to remember, or scrawled things on a wall, or drew drew predators and prey on the walls of a cave so that others could gather and admire and learn. You know, we were offloading aspects of ourselves into the world. And so, you know, the moment you start talking about the differences between us and our creations, and LNM is an amazing thing. Of course, it's part of a network of networks. But, mm. you know, if you imagine what it's like to quote unquote be one, you know, it, it only lives, um, so to speak, it only sparks into life in response to an input. And that input is then, you know, connected to a sublimely complex form of weighted autocomplete. And token by token, it's built up. And then it dies again the moment it produces the output. Its entire world is a data string input 
obviously a series of trained weights from a training process and then a data string output. Or again, a denoising visual model is just that, it's denoising. Now, the fact that this can replicate so many of our achievements, that there are kind of emergent structures within this that are correlates of some kinds of understanding and reasoning is remarkable, is mm. amazing. But it's utterly unlike us, which is also amazing. And we anthropomorphize at our peril. Mm. But I think you're right that then, if I look for hope, it's in the fact that individually we are tiny, but the individual is not the correct unit for debating the future of humanity or human culture. There's no mm. such thing as an individual human life, really. We're born into total dependency. In his book, Dependent Rational Animals, which is um, a series of lectures he gave as a, as a kind of older man, really, the philosopher Alastair McIntyre describes our mutual dependency um, and the biological kind of determinism of this mm. as, as one of the defining features of human ethics. You know, we always, we have, we always have been are or about to become dependent upon others. And of course, the fruits of our culture, the human made world is utterly dependent in incredibly complicated ways and woven into the world's ecosystems. And this is not mystical hand waving. You know, this is this is kind of absolute baseline empirical facts. Yeah. Um, and I think the great challenge for me is articulating this kind of rigorously and then saying, well, what follows from this? What, what follows from this in terms of what we should do? And, and I guess one of the things it, it makes me think very strongly is that the, the purely kind of consequentialist approach, which effectively says, it's only the outputs of a system that matters. This is just the output of it. It doesn't matter. The other makes a beautiful picture. It solves the problem. You know, nobody knows how it's doing it. So don't worry. It's a, a bit like a version of the Turing test. If it quacks yeah. like a duck and sounds like a duck, then it's a duck. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, quite the reverse is true of many areas of human activity and social activity in existence. There are many, many things that are intrinsically important for us to be involved in. Because, for example, hmm. when my children come home from school and they've drawn some pictures and written some stories, they're eight and ten now. I don't turn around and say, my goodness, these are rubbish. You could have used AI. You know, go on, chat GPT, yeah. <laughs> stable diffusion, much better than you. Don't waste your time writing little stories. Don't waste your time drawing pictures. Don't waste your time playing games. Football. We use AI to solve football, work out all the results, then nobody has to play football. Done. Yeah. yeah. So, from justice to education to self-expression, the process is the point of many things. Mm. And there's a really important distinction between those areas in which we we want to minimise human involvement, if they're dull, if they're demeaning, if they're dangerous, or perhaps if there's very clear evidence that our presence introduces sources of noise and bias um, that are detrimental to, to kind of human beings. Mm. But... But, 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 really big but, from justice to democratic participation to education to leisure to art to beauty to the all-important question of, well, given everything they can do, what should we be trying to do with machines? Human involvement in these things, human participation in them is 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 also the point of our existence. It's how we make points to be human. We change by thinking just as we're changed by how much we've eaten and where we are and who we're in company with, the process is not easily extricable from the product. And so consequentialism, which is an incredibly powerful tool for weighing up outcomes and determining between resource resource allocations and so on, it's very important. But it's also a, a tool that needs to be limited in order to in order to be you know, kind of ethically coherent. Mm. The point always lies elsewhere. And so there's, I've got a whole bunch of beautiful, poignant quotes that I extracted from your writing. So I'm wonder where, wondering where to go next. But I think one of the things I really liked that I found provocative and intriguing was the way in which you open up the book with the central premise that the evolution of humans and technology are in in inextricably intertwined and as tempting as it can be in the face of overwhelming speed, scale and significance through which we're adopting um, and rolling out technology, in particular AI, um, you call for us to resist the denigration of human agency and to overcome delusions that we hold about technology. And each of the chapters, most of the chapters, hold this question around you know, the delusion of, and then you pick on a particular theme to really 
open up and expand upon. What are some of the most intransigent delusions that you yeah. feel if you're going to pick a few well, that we need two, to dismantle? The two foundational ones for me are what I call the delusion of inevitability and the delusion of neutrality. Mm. And for me, the delusion of inevitability is also a kind of deterministic view, which basically says that technology, technology emerges really according to you know, sort of features, I guess, of the physical world or the sort of possibility space. Mm. Um, and that once it's emerged, then the course of history and the kind of in aggregate in the longer term is set. Certain weapons are evolved, they can't be uninvented, so they dictate certain outcomes. A medium like television evolves, emerges, is invented, and then certain behaviours and outcomes follow sort of logically and inexorably from it and can't be resisted. And so this is often the kind of battle cry of tech disruption. You move fast and break things, but why? Yeah. Well, partly because on some level you believe or choose to believe that the technology you've invented will, will do what it does, it will have its effects, um, that it's a kind of a Luddite thing in the pejorative sense to resist it in despair, and it's futile. Resistance is futile, yeah. <laughs> uh, as the as the Borg so neatly put it. Man, quoting the um, the philosopher Alan Sakasas, who talks about what he calls the Borg complex approach, and I think this is a terrible way of thinking about history in the future, because I think it ignores the the far more kind of looping complexity of our relationships mm -hmm. with and through technology. Brian Merchant has recently written a fine book about the Luddites emphasizing the fact that far from being deluded idiots who just thought, you know, like tools were bad and wanted to go back to pre-technological state, they were skilled workers who recognized that they were um, having their lives ruined um, and mm -hmm. being, being forced into terrible kind of contractual relationships and exploited by, by people who had enough money to own factories. And, and, you know, there's been a negotiation over the last, you know, few centuries about people asserting certain rights, certain desires, certain asks, you know, when we look at human history closely, I think what we see is actually a plethora of different possible futures, mm. different desires, different asks, different values. We see a negotiation. On the one hand, we don't get to uninvent technologies. They do have this incredible momentum, this power that drives, us, that drives things forward. On the other hand, this only makes the kind of collective prize of an informed negotiation with technology all the more precious around the yeah. world right now with AI. We're seeing people legislating to try and control it, to try and say what's important. And interestingly, just one point on this, if you go back 15 years, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was inevitably going to make the world free. Yeah. Across the entire world, dictatorships would tumble. <clears throat> Freedom was just baked into the bites. You know, there was no resisting this. It was inevitable, da di da I mean, I mean, that was nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the governments were like, oh, look, we're governments. We, you know, we hold a monopoly over violence. Um, we control the, you know, the, the physical infrastructure. We're going to show you. So there's many different internets. Yeah. There's many different ways of doing AI. There's many, you know, so inevitability, I think, is a, is a get out clause. If the future is inevitable, you don't need to think about it. Mm -hmm. If technology inevitably does X or Y, then anyone who wants to legislate or limit it to it is an idiot. Um, and you just got to kind of get with the plan. That's very convenient if you're a technologist of a certain ilk. Um, the much more difficult story, what I want to do in a way is, in each case for these delusions, swap, take away the easy story and try and replace it with the, the more complicated, but I think more robust story, whereby, yes, our agency is collective and imperfect and belated, but, but in the long term, it is powerful. We get to choose we get to deflect the path of technology mm. and again look at decarbonization i don't think it's inevitable that x will happen or y will happen in terms of energy infrastructure in terms of grids look around the world there's a lot of variety but where there's a will where there's a desire where there's a pressure hopefully together we can you know deflect the path of technology and believing it's inevitable is very dangerous and very quickly i think what goes with this is what I call the delusion of neutrality. Mm. And that's summed up by the phrase, there's technology is neither good nor bad, it's just how you use it. Or, to use another phrase, guns don't kill people. Yeah. People kill people. It, just, it just makes no sense. People do kill people. But if I want to kill you, a big semi-automatic rifle is probably better than a pen or a handkerchief. And yeah. Similarly, I think in terms of neutrality, and this again is where it, where it interfaces with inevitably, a, a town in which everyone walks around with a semi-automatic rifle, rifle 
slung over their shoulder is a very different kind of place to live in terms of value and ethic than one in which people don't. Now, I can imagine a town in which people have semi-automatic rifles slung over their shoulder that's a great place to live. I don't actually think it inevitably means that it's an evil and terrible place. But of course, as, as gun owners and activists would say, you know, that's because you have to kind of legislate pretty hard in terms of social norms, in terms of values. Um, more broadly, I think it's really pernicious to just shrug your shoulders and say text neutral, just how you use it. Because then, just like if the future is inevitable, the people who make technology don't have much of an obligation beyond building what they believe to be kind of a good, reliable system that does what it says it does and returns value to their shareholders. Mm. In schools, for example. And, and I love using examples that involve children because you can't help but be emotive about these things yeah. because it doesn't really work <laughs> to just pretend it's a cold, cool question. So there are different models at the moment. There are schools in which children are surveilled in real time yeah. by <clears throat> cameras that are assessing their faces. They're using systems. They're being monitored for attention. Um, they're being kind of tested and, you know, they're being treated as potential cheats who need to be monitored at all times. Their computers are monitoring them while they're at home, spying on them, trying to make sure they're not they're not cheating or looking stuff up, um, analysing their faces, their body language, what they do, reporting back to the school, reporting back to the government. Um, there are, of course, places in the world um, where facial recognition systems and AI mm. are being used to target minorities, to target people of certain faiths, to target people of certain skin colours and... and um, backgrounds and so on now is this just a neutral technology being used in a bad way well no it's more complicated than that it's a very very powerful technology that has a tendency towards certain kinds of power imbalance certain kinds of exploitation um just as if i go to los angeles and i'm walking around a city predicated upon car ownership that city is not only a car is not just kind of value neutral mm. you know the city is geared up towards certain assumptions about living about education about thriving about neighborhoods compared to um, a european city or a walkable city or whatever so i think it's it's not that technologies are good or bad this is a bad technology this is a good technology full stop it's that in very complicated ways they have a momentum that makes certain kinds of behavior and interaction and idea and value more likely that makes certain ones less likely or less possible. Yeah. And we absolutely need to think about the values and assumptions and unintended consequences that technologies push us towards, that their momentum drives us towards, and then have a negotiation. So we ban facial recognition in schools, for example, or we have pedestrianized precincts, or we have, or we build car parks, or we you know, regulate guns or, you know, we do kind of simpler and more basic things like that and, mm. and um, pay attention to the mapping of cities, the languages that are put up on, on signs to, it's called the affordances of technologies. Yeah. 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 It's so complex. I was listening to um, a podcast of the day between someone who's been working extensively in the US military and they were talking about the autonomization of warfare and the different perspectives that one can bring to that. Obviously not, yeah, so the, the most obvious thing to say is that obviously any kind of human suffering, I think at least, it's desirable to try and avoid if we could live in a society where we felt safe and didn't have this, this quality of, um, Violence, but you know, anyway, we're creatures. And one of the things that they were talking about, the sort of two sides, one of the sides was that if you can reduce <clears throat> human error, if you're engaged in war because you're trying to protect your society from some enemy, um, then being able to reduce human error and civilian casualties, let's say, would be a good thing. So it's so a humanitarian within the context of slaying other humans, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's all a bit twisted, but a humanitarian perspective. The alternative was, what if you're using these technologies to target folks that you otherwise would not be able to access, kill, etc.? So like specific moves that you might do if you were piloting a plane, that if you had human pilots would be so costly that no one would, no one would engage in it. 
then suddenly you have two AIs who are fighting against one another and you can escalate things very quickly. Or maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would just be kind of like a meltdown where there's some sort of AI-based checkmate where neither would be able to because the cost would be too great or what have you. So um, it seems from what they were saying that we're not there yet, but there is something really, for me, it kind of asks this much deeper question, which is, how do we want to live? And it's back to your point about education and process and intrinsic value and beauty. Um, and there was another quote that, that I think, I mean, it's all connected to this, but you write, we have bent the earth to our will. As its systems start to pass beyond certain tipping points, we're discovering that it no longer yields. Perhaps it's time to learn another lesson that mastery is no longer a fit aspiration for our species. And that's really, you know, you're pointing towards a core species level and individual level existential question that points towards the values that are embedded within our current and developing systems, how they've evolved. Um, And so I'm wondering, when you think about how all these things are knitted together and how the ways in which we build tools, technologies with certain affordances stem from a very human desire to, well, towards violence or reproduction or towards beauty and love. I mean, all that whole mix that is implicated in human life. How might we orient towards a more life-affirming, and I'm Mm. thinking life beyond just our species, a life-affirming set of values that give rise towards more compassionate, regenerative systems? So it's very much about the stories we tell how we frame the questions, the story we believe ourselves to be a part of. In the book, I talk about authors like um, Guy Vince and uh, the economist Kate Raworth. Mm. Kate Raworth is probably the most kind of clear example of someone who, in in her work around what she calls donut economic, has produced literally a vision, a representation of economic progress, um, not as a graph that's going up and up and up and up and up, but as a donut, which embodies a more like a kind of a measure of systemic resilience, more like a kind of a health check or a pulse rate. And what it shows is the on the on the exterior of the donut, so to speak, the the capacity of the Earth's of our planet's life supporting systems to be to be sustained, the the ability at which, you know, in terms in terms of systems of water of air of biodiversity and so on pollution um whether we are within limits or not or whether we are dangerously outside those limits in terms of how fast we are using things up or degrading them and on the other hand the kind of bottom of this is basic indices of um of human thriving or flourishing the kind of preconditions the preconditions of being able to live a a good thriving life and and this is this is a, a way of seeing. It's a visualization. It's a story that suggests that resilience and balance is a perfectly reasonable, <laughs> can be empirically grounded way of of looking to the future and looking to the intergenerational future. We're looking to the very long term. It doesn't just have to be a graph heading towards infinity. And of course, it doesn't have to mean an end to innovation and progress of other kinds. Um, I firmly believe there's no kind of pre-technological Eden we can go back to. But the story of our species is the story of, of technology and our self-invention and our altering of the world. But we can build, we can aim for resilience, we can aim for sustainability in all its forms, and probably we need to do this through innovation. And this is this is a powerful story. And in fact, I think one of the most dangerous things we can do is uncritically embrace the idea that kind of a a neo-Darwinian violence, as yeah. in their sign, you kill me or I kill you, is the defining story of our species. Also, it seems to me that's empirically literate, that although tribal and national and personal violence mars our history and our present is a terrible, terrible thing, fundamentally, as creatures, as mammals, as apes, we get along. We're incredibly empathetic. And if you look at the degree of vulnerability and dependency we have, uh, how hard a culture is to maintain. This is our defining trait. Sarah Blifferhardy and others have written about this in evolutionary terms, where I quote the great science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin, who who wished to put the the container, the carrier, 
as the defining technology of our species rather mm. than the spear. Um, and you mentioned, you know, autonomous warfare and so on. And of course, that's a story. That's a story of escalation. Yeah. There's a story about the kind of clean, technologically facilitated destruction of the body of the leader. But unintended consequences proliferate in these spaces. People respond, people escalate. And of course, one of the great, albeit imperfect, success stories of the 21st century, the 20th century, has been, you know, people coming together and communicating with a degree of openness to put limits around, for example, biological, chemical, nuclear weapons, and indeed around um, various forms of genetic oh. engineering, and potentially around technologies like AI. Now, these are very imperfect processes, <laughs> but they have done some good. And they they show that they the idea of an arms race in the kind of literal, escalatory, inexorable sense is is a story that is that is too simple for the world. And I think unintended consequences proliferate in these spaces. Mm. You can fall in love with a nice story. This is clean, this is surgical, this is simple, this is keeping us safe. Of course, I don't think we're going to be living in a world without armies anytime soon. Mm. And, I, and I, just like I don't think one should yearn for some mystical Eden that never existed of pre-technology, because technology is older than our species. We became who we are because of flames, because of fires, because of tools, because of shelters, because of containers. Similarly, I think if there is conflict in the world and there are fundamental clashes between values, probably on some level you're going to want an army that can stop people from coming and killing you and your children. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, interestingly, I think we have to beware the seduction of overly simple stories. Yeah. Um, and speaking of stories, this is something which I've been hearing a lot of more about recently, thinking about things like misinformation, deep fakes, the ability to manipulate. Um, <laughs> I was painting the corridor up a very tall ladder while listening to this bit and I had to come down <laughs> up the ladder, put the paint down and write this into my notes to make sure I didn't lose the quote. But it really, really struck me. And it's part of a much longer passage, but you're talking about ways in which we shape attention. And the quote was, in effect, manipulation of attention is about someone else trying to define the terms of your relationship with the world, that which counts and that which is passed over. And at the very top of this conversation, we were talking about the disintegration, I don't know if you use that word particularly, but disintegration of the public sphere of having some kind of way of coming together. And I think, which, which, and it may be an imperfect example, but I always used to think about when I was growing up, you know, you'd go to the news agents to buy some sweets and there would be your five or six main papers, a couple of broad, or not, probably a few more than that, but the broad sheets and the tabloids. And regardless of which one you picked, I remember always seeing the headlines. I would scan all the headlines and you'd get a flavor for what the focus in each particular paper would be over the months that you might be exposed to that. And it located a certain or kind of triangulated certain positions within which you could have conversations that would kind of link to certain perspectives. So you could have a sense of what different people were reading. And it always struck me growing up that time as compared to now, where obviously writers and perspectives <clears throat> that are shared always have a particular angle. But the difference is that if you have a sense of what people's angles are, you have a starting point or at least a shared uh, map of a territory, let's say, which is imperfect and incomplete, but it's shared. Now, when we have such a hyper-personalized, atomized experience of our online environments, to the extent that, for instance, I could potentially be looking at the same post on Instagram and just see different comments below, depending on my perspectives historical behavior, et cetera. What do you think we can do about the proliferation of misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes, when at its more amplified state, the result, one of the results can be a complete mistrust of information and there, therefore like an apathy of like, well, if I can't trust anything, what's the point? Do you yes, know what I'm kind of like? We yeah, have we to go, be able we, to think about this together. We go back to sort of to paraphrase Hannah Arendt's line that you know the danger of the the realm of kind of propaganda and disinformation and so mm. on is not that um, people believe anything; it's that people believe nothing. Right. And I, I think again, of course, 
it's it's easy to sort of leap to the extreme position that everyone mm. is sort of atomized. And, and of course, actually, the, the evidence around filter bubbles is much more critical than that. We also, a lot of the time, encounter more diverse voices online um, than we might in, in our everyday life. Um, I have more exposure, I think, to, to views very different to mine and worldviews very different to mine um, than if I was going to the news agents and buying my paper. <laughs> but I think the key thing is the, the, the story question, because I'm, I'm very suspicious of the idea that the kind of governments or clever people or whoever should sort of legislate for truth. Um, should kind of put their thumbs on the scales and, and start penalising um, just, just the, you know, wrong think, so to speak. Mm. That's very different from, you know, kind of actively slanderous or libelous or, 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 or kind of dangerous. Um, but I think we should be very cautious indeed about about creating tools for the policing of truth, because of course mm. those tools can be co-opted. The crucial thing is also, and I find this again and again, saying to someone Look, you're wrong here's the facts it's the least persuasive thing <laughs> yeah. you can possibly say yeah and, and the key to understanding this is, is is i think that you know it's it's not really about the facts it's about the story it's about you know kind of how how facts are mobilized into a claim um about what about what it means to people one of the things i find most depressing is is when someone you know might say to me, for example, I literally can't think of a single good reason why anyone would vote for Brexit, or I cannot understand why a person would ever vote for Trump. It's beyond me. Um, now, as you might guess, I'm not really a Trumpy Brexity kind of guy, um, but these are important questions. Like it's really important that I can understand why why very large numbers of people yeah. might vote might, might, might vote for these things. And they're not all, they're not bad, they're not evil, they're not stupid people. But, you know, you've got to get away from that. Mm. Um, and, and in these cases, among other things, I think, you know, there's a very understandable impulse that if someone, America or Britain, might feel that they've been treated with contempt by the government, that there are, um, you know, there's a bureaucratic class who have lied to them, who have patronised them, who haven't delivered for them, um, then a vote to a vote against those people a vote against that system is perfectly reasonable or people mm. who might might prefer the idea of of not of not of certain kinds of people not having power over them these are these are reasonable things to believe and this to me is the key then which is very difficult but it's to understand that people very different to you have their reasons um, yeah. Now, one of the best things we can do, I think, is you know expose ourselves to a range of views in, in a in a way that sort of has represents kind of cognitive diversity, uh, not just as in non neurotypical ways of thinking, um, but just as in people who have, have have different views on the world because their minds work in different ways, or they come from different countries, or different classes, or different regions. Um, but I think one of the great dangers and one of the kind of some of the dark patterns. Mm. Your nine can absolutely be that the the kind of the values, the assumptions baked into the system you're using are entirely geared towards keeping you clicking, keeping you engaged, keeping you emotionally aroused, outraged, yeah. rewarding the short, the sensational, um, having very, very few collective filters. So interestingly, community mm. notes on X previously Twitter, I think, is a very good fact-checking service in its own way. It often yields really good results because, um, a little bit like Wikipedia editing, it can encourage people to be very thoughtful. I think more systems like that, less reward of the instant and the fast. But on an individual level, we also need to recognise that, that people, the story that I've been betrayed by the government, that pharmaceutical companies have lied to me, that the health service has let me down, that's not necessarily a lie. That's not necessarily a misguided story. And the tail wags the dog. Hmm. If that's my experience of the world, I might then go and seek out facts and people who speak for me, who speak to my grievances. So I think locating all this in the world of facts and misinformation and treating people like idiots who are swayed by, who are swayed by kind of demagogues and master persuaders um, is actually, again, not really an empirically true story. That it's the more, it's rooted in society, right? If people are, um, if people are disillusioned, if people are let down, look to the truths. Look to the truths, to the true expressions of, of a life in in someone's 
stories because if you can't understand and speak to that need and redress it um you know you're just going to make things worse by trying to kind of correct what they see mm -hmm. having said all that i think to go back to the dark patterns point i think there are you know kind of certain forums that inscrutably prioritize very very kind of divisive material it finds people waiting for it but you can get on this kind of conveyor belt of radicalization of amplification where you're sure served if you've engaged with something you'll serve more and more videos or clips that feed and fuel that and that kind of escalatory dark pattern i think is can be very dangerous and pernicious mm -hmm. because because people all of us all of us are very vulnerable cognitively to this kind of reinforcement and especially if we are you know so you can get into these difficult and dangerous places um and then find it hard to get out of them mm. so coming I, I feel like we've just literally barely scratched the surface we've gone to about three or four quotes and i had a mountain um but one of the things that you wrote about in the book that you kind of touched on at various different points and you've talked about being a dad and the importance of the ways in which we show up to one another and with our children. Um, you wrote, no matter who, what, or how you love, it's the collective project of doing so that bears our species forward. Our vulnerability, our enduring empathetic interdependency is also our greatest strength. And I love that because it's so rare in a book about technology to hear that story so powerfully told and revisited and woven throughout the different chapters of your book. And so I'm thinking if we were going to give ourselves a story about what it means to be human in an age of AI and systemic change, what might that look like for you? I was very keen to kind of center the idea of love and, and the multiplicity of it. I love my children. I would die for my children, as most parents would. I hope I don't have to. <laughs> but of course, inevitably, I will die. And I very much hope it will be before my children. But there are plenty of people in the world who don't have children. It's completely legitimate you don't have to have children. <laughs> um, but you can love, you can have a passion for creation, politics. Hopefully not for violence. Mm. Some people are made that way. Um, and... And I do believe, actually, that it's our participation in these things larger than us that that bears us forward collectively. And I do believe, and this is a point made by the philosopher Samuel Scheffler in a remarkable thought experiment, when he says, imagine, if you will, that you live your normal life, your full allotted span. Mm -hmm. And then the day after you die of natural causes, happily or whatever, the world is destroyed by a meteorite, obliterated into nothing. This is going to happen with certainty, but it's equally certain that you will not experience it and it will have no impact whatsoever materially upon your life. Does that change the way you feel? And for most people, it changes things profoundly. Mm -hmm. It changes things profoundly because they feel that it hollows out the pleasure they take in most things. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's an appalling thing. The idea that in a kind of, moments after we're gone everything will be gone and and Scheffler follows this with the observation then that actually although we may appear to be you know kind of egotistical we may appear to be hedonistic we may appear to be driven by kind of our desire to not die to have pleasure and to look after number one in, in fact especially as we as we grow and if we are not in a situation of kind of just desperation um the value of almost everything we care about and consider important and interesting that makes life worth living is bound up with some sense of its continuity after us that it will be kind of that, that it's collective that will be handed on and continued mm. by others we don't believe our species i think will exist forever but we desperately hope that we will find ways collectively to thrive in the long term this for me is a very useful vision of long-termism because a i think it doesn't go down the um kind of repugnant mathematics of future generations <laughs> but also it emphasizes then that that participating in projects and ideas and meaning making and nurture and caring and creation that that 
that is part of something larger than ourselves, that is enduring, that is handed on, that is handed over, that, that links us to the grander sweep of history and geography and time, is how we make meanings in this life. And once our material needs are, let, are met, which is hugely important, and meeting people's material basic needs is the, the great task. Mm. But once we've done that, so when I think about this question of, you know, what should we do, where are we going, you know, actually, despite the kind of talk of egotism and uh, consequentialism and, and, and kind of human, that, that has a very kind of lowered view of the human animal as fundamentally selfish, I think that's utterly, utterly wrong and psychologically illiterate. That it's the, and then the great question is, okay, so if we want to meaningfully participate in, in things larger than ourselves on the scale of community, on the scale of inheritance, on the scale of creation, what does it mean for the human made world to afford us these opportunities hmm. to make the riches of the past and present available to us, to allow us to find and exercise meaningful skill and agency to, to pursue a purpose that, that belongs to us, but that doesn't kind of denigrate or diminish others' purposes? Um, and of course, historically, religion has been one of the great forces doing this. Religion has not been unalloyed good. Or yeah. nice religions. But again, to be dismissive or ignorant about religion, I think, is to be incurious about precisely some of the most powerful and fundamental aspects of human nature. Mm. I'm, a, so to speak, a secular churchgoer in that I you know, do quite a few things through through local churches and religious organisations. Some of the some of the best and richest conversations I've had about technology have been with priests and rabbis and imams and Buddhists um, because they begin from a premise of an exalted view of humanity. Mm. I mean, I think you should go and become a priest. But, but interestingly, I think so far as possible, we need to centre and normalise this kind of exalted view of ourselves as bound up with the, the stuff of, you know, culture and meaning, purpose of the grander sweep of time. We, 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 we desperately, these things are very important, that once the basic needs are net, it doesn't have to be family. Of course yeah. not. But I think the the way that family can confer purpose in a deep sense upon you and remind you of your smallness is, is psychologically very healthy. And other things that can do that, that confront us with this and stories that take us away from that, that, that kind of deprive us of this vocabulary and feeling and purpose and tools that do that as well, that cut us out of these things are to be treated with a great deal of suspicion so penultimate question for this section Sorry, um, very long answers so. no i love it it's so interesting that's the whole point is to get to listen to your thinking and um and i don't know if this will be a repetitious question given that we've just covered some points that might relate to it but how do you find or orient yourself towards hope and beauty on dark days well i my family mm. I think is is a very simple answer. <laughs> this simple experience of people caring for them and giving them attention is important no matter else what's going no matter what else is going on. So just that simple daily exposure to people whose lives in some sense matter more than your own mm. is quite a healthy thing and I owe them hope. And I'm a privileged and lucky person. It's I can count many blessings. Um and I and I think it's a very good thing to count the big and the small blessings. I like spending, I like writing for children and going into schools and talking to people. You know, I run workshops. I run a workshop this week for 150 or 14 year olds ah. talking about technology and TikTok and social media and so on. Ah. And it was wonderful. It was full of energy, thoughtfulness, engagement, filled me with hope. Um, and also I love playing the piano. Yeah, and you're a, you're amazing jazz well, pianist. I've heard. I don't know if you play other things, but like... just for my own, <laughs> just, just to please myself, really. And but because you get lost in it, yeah, and because it's beautiful, and fairly obviously as well, it reminds you the point of music is not to get to the end quickly. Yes, you're not going to say well, that's wonderful. AI will enable me to listen to all of Beethoven in 35 seconds. Yeah, or I'll never have to play <laughs> piano again. You know, who can tell the dancer from the dance? Mm -hmm. It's um. You know, to be to be it, to do it, it's and it's a great privilege to have those things in one's life and the space and the time to enjoy them. That's why I think actually it's very kind of patronising and dangerous to want to 
take steps in terms of policy to deny other people information or opportunity um, or, the, or the fruits of certain kinds of technology and development. Um, there's a lot to be hopeful for in, in, in the world, but, but often it speaks kind of softly and more locally than, than that which commands headlines. And the terror and the horror is very real indeed. But, you know, without hope, where are we? Well, Tom, there's so much more to say, but if people want to find out more about your fantastic work, all 12 plus books, workshops, podcasts, interviews, hold it up, <laughs> hold it up. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this, is, this is the one you should read. This is my favourite. <laughs> is it actually your favourite? Well, I always oh, don't know. They're like children, aren't they? But yeah. no, I, I, loved, I loved that I got to write a slightly bonkers book. Um, I, I just, it, it's big and quite personal. Yes. And it definitely doesn't have a kind of neat here's what I'm saying in a handy little nutshell. Um, but so that's the beauty it, of it. I hope so, you know, but it, but it made it a very, it, it, it's lovely to, as a writer, it's nice to sort of find a tone in which you can, you can be yourself. Yeah. And I feel that obviously my, my, my self on the page is different to myself in person, but I, I feel that there's quite a lot of me on the page mm. and, and, and and that's great. And I'm fine if people disagree with me. It's, the book <laughs> is an offering. It's it's uh, saying here are some ways of seeing. I hope you find them interesting. Mm. But it's not a claim that I'm right or correct, which would be absurd. Mm. So if people want to find out more, where are the best places to find you? Well, yeah, you can you can, you can Google me and find. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I use X <laughs> occasionally for pianos and things like that. I do writing and broadcasting, but you know, my my books can be bought from from all good um, online and physical outlets. I would hope. Um, and, um, and I try not to be too active online, but, um, yeah, I probably through, through X and LinkedIn, God bless them. And your website. Uh, and my, and I have a website. Yes, I do. Tom Uh, but I, you know, it's not that exciting. <laughs> well, it is. You can find all of your books on there. Lots oh, of yes, interesting. Okay. It is. Yes, no, it's I, a it half is of exciting. activity. It Tom. is exciting, but I'm, but I'm often to be found talking and thinking yeah. aloud. Okay. Well, um, Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Lovely.